uh, last panel here. Uh, I'll introduce briefly some of the, the panelists, but we have a, a guest uh, here substituting. So first of all, on, the, on my far left here is Cleet Johnson. Uh, he's a partner in the Wilkinson uh, Barker Nauer Law Firm and works with clients at the intersection of technology and security. You can read more about him in the book. And then Manisha Ghosh, who is going to play two roles here. She's a research professor of molecular engineering at University of Chicago but also an NSF program manager where she manages a portfolio of wireless networking uh, programs. And then our special guest star here is Rebecca Dorch. We had a cancellation this morning due to a, medi due to a medical issue and Rebecca was able to step in. Rebecca is currently the Senior Spectrum Policy Analyst at the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, which is part of the government labs right across Broadway from us. Uh, her focus is on spectrum sharing, she recently managed the conformance testing program for the spectrum access system and environmental sensing capability of the components of the 3.5 gigahertz citizens broadband radio service. In 2018, she was the vice chair of the International Symposium on Advanced Radio Technologies. And prior to joining NTA in 2016, I hired her by the way, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rebecca served for 13 years as the Western Region Director of the FCC's Enforcement Bureau where she oversaw the resolution of harmful interference effects on communications. So with that, let's uh, start off talking about things. So we're kind of the, the batting cleanup tonight, trying to uh, sort of summarize everything that's gone before and uh, hopefully let everybody leave with a sense of hope, not a sense of pessimism. So let me start off with Cleet and just uh, ask, start off with what's, what's the view from DC on these issues? Are the right agencies paying attention? I think that's the, the, the question of the era in some ways. And uh, not to jump ahead, but I really look forward to hearing what Dr. Porter has to say about this from the DOD perspective. And what, I, what I'll do to, to start off, Keith, is just say, first of all, to admit I am not an engineer. I'm a lawyer and policymaker. And I have spent my career, uh, most of my career, in the national security arena, the US Army uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. And so I'm sort of an interloper in this communications world. Uh, with a, sub, a couple of stints at the FCC and the Department of Commerce. Um, and what I, what I will say, uh, just, to, just to level set here and talk about why are we even talking about uh, spectrum vulnerabilities and uh, saving our spectrum. And something I like to do in, in, a, in a discussion like this is just to make this abstract uh, cyber threat concrete. Um, it just seems like this nameless, faceless uh, abstraction. But what we might do is, is, is think about it in terms of, uh, of concrete adversaries, uh, intelli tier one intelligence services, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran in particular, and then a whole host of other non-state criminal groups or proxies that work uh, with and for those uh, intelligence services. Um, we're really talking about tens of thousands of people uh, who, like all of us here today, here in the audience, go to school, go to work, they provide for their families, they uh, find fulfillment in their daily life by trying to figure out how to get into our networks and devices. This is what they do, it's their job. Um, and so it's not some abstraction, it's a, it's a, a, a concrete uh, set of forces that are, that are out there working on this every day. And, um, and I think that, that one of the reasons that the, the defense and national security establishment has in recent years, and it, with a uh, with a, a really steep uh, curve uh, toward uh, urgency, has awoken to the um, to the to the concerns in in the five G world in particular, uh, is that the more that everything is connected, the more uh, you cannot secure your battle space, to put it in defense terms, uh, through geography or through a perimeter. If everything is connected, then everything is vulnerable. And that's quite a cliche and sort of uh, uh, simplifies things too much. Um, but that's the, that, that moving from a mobile environment, moving from a, 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 a wired environment to a mobile environment in the two, 2G, 3G, 4G world to a 5G environment where everything is connected and, uh, and every sector is, uh, is, is part of this connected environment. Um, and there are no, there's no government agency that can kind of focus in on, uh, you know, the health. We were just talking about the healthcare sector. 
um, that the FDA can't, can't uh, secure the entire environment or NHTSA can't in secure the entire environment even if it's got uh, jurisdiction over, over connected cars and on and on down the list. Um, is uh, we, we need multidisciplinary interagency and also public, private, government, and, and industry. Uh, because if everything is connected, then, the, then all of the solutions need to be connected. Um, and so a, 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 short, a short answer to your question, Keith, is are the right agencies looking, are the right agencies looking at it? In some ways, the problem is everybody's looking at it, and so it's in in some ways it's sort of like the three-year-old soccer uh, match, <laughs> where you know five G's the ball and everybody's running to it. Um, uh, the good news is that things are starting to become much more coordinated uh, with key agencies, sort of the, the key domestic agencies, uh, DHS, the Department of Commerce, both NTIA and NIST, uh, and the FCC, uh, backed up internationally and in the um, the defense and, uh, and international uh, realm by DOD and the State Department. Of course, DOJ and FBI have a very significant role to play. And then in each of those uh, sector regulatory agencies and sector specific agencies, um, there are a number of players looking at these issues as well. So we at least have a chance to have the right, uh, the right team on the field. Uh, it has not, it, it's still early preseason, <laughs> and uh, the, the bad news is for the, for the bad guys, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're well into the playoffs. So we got, uh, we've got a lot of work to do, but at least the right uh, team is, is coming together. Um, and I think the next frontier is, is really fully cohering that federal interagency team, linking it up to their counterparts and other allied governments. And then the final frontier will be getting all the disparate actors in the private sector, uh, of whom nobody is in charge uh, it, writ large, um, to, to be part of this solution set. Um, it's going to take a holistic effort in the, in the same way that the connected world is itself holistic and multi multidisciplinary. Sure. Would you like to you jump in on that? The National Science Foundation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a huge part of it, right. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> coordinates the wireless spectrum R&D group, which is an interagency working group that we meet every often, every month or so, and then we have an annual meeting where we exchange what's going on. So from the NSF perspective, uh, what we are very interested in finding out is uh, what, are the, what are the real problems on the ground that the other agencies are seeing, the DOJs and the Department of Commerce. Uh, with the FCC and NTIA, we have a better connection as to what is going on and what are the issues that we should be focusing on. And when I say we, I mean the entire academic community of researchers that we fund, which is a huge resource, which sometimes I feel is underutilized uh, in the sense that there is very exciting research which is going on. A lot of the news items that you see of threats being discovered or um, solutions being proposed are coming from the academic community. Uh, and I think we need to get that community much better connected uh, to both industry as well as um, the federal agencies so that all of their horsepower can be put to play in this environment. Do you have anything to add on that? Or? On that one, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, She's already playing her role. <laughs> uh, so Manish, can you Manisha, can you riff on that a little bit more? I mean, what kind of programs are there? Are they funded adequately, or no? Well, funding is never uh, adequate, right? Uh, <laughs> I read I read a letter to the editor once, coming from an NSF program manager, saying NSF stands for not sufficient funds. <laughs> so yes, uh, we could do more. We could always yeah. do better. And if there's anybody here who has clout with Congress, yes, please. Um, we are well-funded in the sense that we think we do a pretty good job of funding the best research that's out there. We get very high-quality proposals. We have special programs uh, surrounding security. We have a huge program called SATSI, Secure and Trusted Communities, which is across departments, including the behavioral and uh, human and sciences, because security, as a number of you have alluded to, includes the human in the loop. So. At the end of the day, even with things like two-factor authorization and all of the other techniques that have come out, you need the human in the loop to be 
aware of why they need to be secure and to take some actions to make, uh, make whatever applications they're working on more secure. Uh, within the wireless group, again, we have a number of programs that deal with it. Um, there was mention made in the past, uh, one of the past uh, panels about uh, testing, and that is definitely a big hole. Uh, security holes can only be discovered by finding them in practice. It's very hard, given the complexity of systems today, to analytically figure out that, yes, this is, and this is a security hole. Uh, and there aren't any adequate testing facilities. 5G is going to roll out as a production system. It's not being experimental, experimented with at the scale at which it's going to roll out. And so, yeah, when it rolls out is when you're going to find the holes that are buried deep in all the layers of the specifications. So we are trying to put money behind building uh, experimental platforms. A NSF has a program called Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. This is a public-private partnership of about 30 companies and universities, which is uh, setting up open test beds that will allow researchers from academia industry and federal agencies um, to perform experiments, to break systems. So you deploy a system and you break it and you find out uh, what the solutions are. Um, somebody mentioned the DARPA Coliseum. So after the big uh, finale in a couple of weeks in Los Angeles, NSF is actually going to take custody of the piece of hardware and software that was built, the Coliseum, and that's going to be stationed in Northeastern University, and we're going to open up that platform to the research community for um, you know, spectrum coexistence, spectrum sharing, security. Uh, that's a really, really powerful uh, platform that can be put to use uh, for many uh, research problems. Great. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Um, Okay, so let, we're, we've been optimistic for a while. Let's go get pessimistic here again. So let me toss out to Rebecca. I warned her about this. Do you have a nightmare scenario in the spectrum world? <laughs> well, I did, but after the panels this morning or this <laughs> afternoon, I think I have a few more things to potentially worry about, especially on the medical panel. There's things that were mm. mentioned that I was not fully aware of. But... Um, um, as you mentioned, I recently oversaw um, for ITS the conformance testing of the spectrum access systems and the environmental, system, environmental sensing capability sensors for the uh, new citizens broadband uh, radio service um, that is uh, just, uh, just uh, being deployed right now. And my sort of nightmare scenario on that one is that notwithstanding all of the careful analysis and the dedicated work um, of, of all the people involved, um, starting with the FCC um, and through the testing that we've done, is that something unexpected or unanticipated um, could occur within that entire ecosystem that could actually um, cause harmful interference. And that, that uh, used to, well, I was going to say, I don't currently lose sleep over it since my part of the project is pretty <laughs> much done. Um, but the other thing is that we did um, do our best to identify unknowns um, during the course of the entire process. Um, and it was part of the risk assessment that was undertaken by all parties that were involved. Um, and um, the, including, I mean, the all parties involved and start with the FCC, um, NTIA's OSM, um, and our new director, Charles Cooper, is in the, um, op, in the, is in the audience somewhere also, or was earlier. Um, and, um, uh, that's, and of course, DOD, and then the, um, the SAS administrators and the ESC operators and the WinForm Standards Group, um, and then the carriers. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, SAS are spectrum access systems, <laughs> so I will use SAS from here on out. Um, uh, ESC is the environmental sensing capability operators, and so I'll probably end up using ESC from, from here on out. Um, but everybody really worked um, to mitigate throughout the course of the entire process um, for example, um, some of the mitigation things that I think that have actually, um, that, that are going to save us from a potential nightmare scenario is that the propagation models that were adopted by um, the WinForm Standards Group for CBRS um, have a fair amount of cushion in them. Um, the testing that ITS did, uh, we did our best to do some ri the, as rigorous testing as, as we possibly could. Um, the FCC is currently un um, doing field testing through the initial commercial deployment. Um, which I think is also going to help pull out um, potential issues that might be out there. 
And the, um, uh, the SAS operators and the ESC, uh, the SAS administrators and ESC operators both did plugs out tests at different times. So everyone has tried to, you know, to, to, do, their, to do their best um, in this brand new um, spectrum sharing situation to be able to, you know, help mitigate um, the risk. But um, beyond CBRS, the whole um, dynamic spectrum sharing um, that we're, the, be, be, dynamic spectrum sharing between very, very different types of communication systems um, as that increases and the density of those devices and systems um, as that sh sharing and density increases. That's where um, I think that we really haven't fully tackled um, the potential for interference at the RF level. Um, and I think we've got some real vulnerabilities potentially there um, that can affect both the reliability and the security um, of our systems um, and our devices um, as, as we you know, proliferate and get them in a really dense, um, dense area. Can I add to the, sure. I, I would say my na nightmare some scenario is, if you think about the 2008 financial crisis, when you had, uh, you know, uh, you had a, a series of uh, subprime loans that were in default in different parts of the country, and unbeknownst to, to lots of people, they were collateralized and split up and, um, you know, spread all over the place, and then they were, they were insured by uh, insurance policies that couldn't back them up, and you had a, a problem in one place that cascaded and took over the entire economy. Um, I, with the, my na nightmare scenario is that as the, the speed of innovation uh, increases, or the, the rate of innovation increases, and the, we deploy billions and billions of devices, which, let me be clear, this is a very good thing. It improves business, it improves quality of life, it, includes, it improves health. That was before I even heard of this, uh, what you might call a corporal private network uh, <laughs> that, that was described <laughs> earlier, uh, I, a CPN, I guess. Um, so there, these, these, are, these are categorically a good thing. But at the same time, it, incre it, it increases these, this connectivity among entities, sectors, uh, companies, people um, that may not be even aware of the connection or where their data sits or how it could be corrupted, manipulated, the network disruptions that create these cascading effects. And as Manisha was saying, we need to test this, th these, these things, uh, these, these networks, and we're not going to know what the bugs are in them until they're out in the, out in the, out in the uh, real world. Uh, we're also not going to know what the opportunities are until they're out in the real world. So the upside is, is also uh, unknown and big. Um, but it, the, the reason I feel some urgency about this, this interagency collaboration and this public-private collaboration that, that uh, Rebecca was talking about is, uh, is because it's, it's, it's crucial. We, the, we're all part of this increasingly symbiotic relationship, um, and we don't know exactly what the effects of that are going to be when something goes wrong. We also don't know what the effects are going to be when we discover that you know, maybe some of this connectivity cures cancer or, you know, uh, creates other things that are unimaginable right now. Um, but that's what we've got to get ready for, is how all of these things cascade and, and, uh, in, un, in ways that are, um, are un, I think one of our panelists said, unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, one other thing, I'm mean, not addressing the nightmare scenario so much, but uh, um, in the previous panels there was a discussion about standards and how that process can sometimes uh, be very difficult to manage. And if you look at the way I did, I used to do standardization in a past life, I used to be in 2011. The way standardization works today is it's basically standards are designed on paper, right? bunch of very smart people get together, we bra you brainstorm ideas, you go off and do some analysis, some simulations, and then there are bake-offs, but it's all on simulation and paper. In the past, it was abs the other way around. The first thing, one of the first things I did in my career was HDTV, and there a system was picked based on whose hardware performed better, right? I don't think that was a great way of doing things either because you could only build a standard for the next 50 years based on what you could build then, right? So the way we do things is better in the sense that we are keeping a path forward of evolving something. But it's gotten a bit too far where 
where everything gets decided on a basis of some assumptions of how systems behave and how we expect them to behave. And so somehow we have to get this feeling of system testing, system experimentation and deployment uh, into the standards making process. Or it has to be a quicker turnaround that, hey, you know, we tested this, we deployed it, these are the bugs, we need to be able to fix the standard quickly. That process takes too long nowadays. And as a community, we, we should probably pay more attention towards that as to how we fix. Somebody mentioned that they, I think Yomna mentioned that they found something and then 3GPP came back and said, sorry, we don't think it's a problem. So ways of, you know, making standards much more easily correctable once uh, defects are uh, found out. It takes too long today to fix uh, problems. Okay, so it well, I think the first panel also talked about this idea of the systems of systems in the standards mm -hmm. and um, the um, the silos that exist yep. even in the standards organizations. And, and when Keith was over at ITS, he was a big advocate of systems of systems analysis. Um, and so I think that that's something that um, without that component to it, and that goes to the whole collaboration issue too, without looking at the whole ecosystems, um, we do uh, leave ourselves vulnerable. So that, so that kind of makes me think about, you know, two issues. There's, there's, you talked about the, the collection of systems that cascade, and you talked a bit about the scale. How do we, how do we test against system of systems effects and, and things at scale? Is that something? I know this is completely out of the blue here, but this yeah, is. Yeah, I think it is, it is a challenging problem. So one approach is we start building experimental test beds, and there's a lot of efforts within the government agencies to do that, but that takes time to roll out. The other is, uh, is, you know, we are living in an experiment, so to speak, right? I mean, all of the data that is being transmitted from cellular networks, Wi-Fi networks, all the sensor networks, it's out there. Uh, you can measure it, you can analyze it, and you can start understanding how these are behaving in the real world. We don't do any of it today. Um, there is very little um, analysis of, say, just, you know, all of us sitting here are connected to base stations. We're connected to Wi-Fi. All of those signal strengths are going back and forth. Your phone has that information. If only, can you imagine, if we could grab the signals of every phone just sitting in this room and goes to a central cloud, and you can analyze it, right? Um, there are, of course, security and privacy issues around just doing that, and those need to be resolved, just as we've had to resolve the issues around medical healthcare data. How do you collate healthcare data from different patients across the world and make use of it? But those are some of the, I think, solutions that need to be investigated as to how we go about getting a much better understanding of the spectrum picture everywhere. I think the, the challenge, uh, everybody, most people in this room are probably familiar with the, with the anecdote from, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when Senator Ted Stevens from, uh, from Alaska referred to the internet as a series of tubes. <laughs> um, and and I, actually, the, the funny thing is there are significant parts of the internet that are a series of tubes. Uh, that's that's uh, just to give the late Senator Stevens some, some credit. Um, but I, I, that, that anecdote points up a challenge that we face in the policymaking community. And that is that if you're, for, for those policymakers who are not deeply technically, uh, um, who, are, who are not technical, and that, this is not a critique, it's the, the vast majority of, of policymakers, um, they see the internet as the, you know, the, the device or mm -hmm. now the connected device uh, and, the, and the tubes, the pipes. Uh, so they, they think uh, almost reflexively that the solution probably lies at the device end or at the ISP. Um, and that's, those are two really important parts of the internet ecosystem, but, uh, but there are only two uh, parts. And you know, maybe they know about a router or a server, but don't really know what that does necessarily. Um, but we've got it, I think in Julie's presentation in the beginning, he laid out six or seven different elements that uh, that need to be part of this solution set. So yes, it definitely is the spectrum engineers and dynamic sharing and uh, addressing interference and jamming and spoofing and, and all of these issues that happen at the radio uh, layer. Um, it's also 
the, just to go down a long list, it's, it is the ISPs, it is the end devices, it's the, uh, it's the, um, the, the gateway uh, in the home or the enterprise, uh, it's the uh, backbone providers, the content delivery networks, the cloud providers, the web hosts, the software developers, the enterprises, to some degree the end user or the consumer, although I think we, we uh, can't, don't want to put too much of the burden on them. Um, and then it's state, local governments, national governments. Uh, that's a long list of entities that need to be coordinated. Uh, and it, that, that's hard to do. Humanity is stovepiped and territorial. It's going to be sort of hard to get all of those players together when nobody is in charge of the whole ecosystem. Um, and I, I think we start by recognizing that it's sort of an existential uh, imperative that we do that. It's also a business imperative because if these cascading effects ripple through the internet ecosystem, it means a lot of money lost by a lot of enterprises. Um, and so we've got to collectively figure out how do we uh, protect the good guys from the, from the bad guys here. So let me jump in on that for a minute. One of the, the previous panels talked about um, the interaction of systems. There was the example of what was it, an airport system that was interfering, knocked, mm -hmm. knocked a hospital off. And you mentioned incentives. So who's responsible for figuring out these interactions? Is it the company that's going to deploy in a particular domain? Or, or how, how do you incentivize them to figure out who am I going to interact with? I, I mean, that, that is the, uh, that's the question of this era. I think because the the real problem is it's not just, I mean maybe the, maybe the the, uh, the airport example is one of the easiest because at least the FAA has the beginning of the of, of the authority, um, but if if you start thinking about where the where the threats come from and how they would interact, uh, how they would affect these systems, um, it's. You know, it, it, it goes well outside the aviation industry. It goes to uh, it, it goes to the software development uh, uh, that, that goes into the, the systems in the first place. It goes to uh, various authentication mechanisms and encryption uh, approaches. It, and you multiply that by every sector in the economy. And the answer is nobody is in charge of that. Um, and it's not even it's not even within the geographical region of the United States, it's, it, it's not even the United States government that, that can purport to be in charge of the, of the internet ecosystem that affects that network. Um, so we've got to figure this out. And I, I, I think it starts with, uh, with the federal government working with, with allied governments and then going down into the interagency. We can walk through some of the, and we could, uh, Pierre would have to pull out his acronym <laughs> the flag one right after the other. But um, the good news is all of these agencies are, are working on this. Uh, and you know, I know that Dr. Porter's counterparts at DHS, Chris Krebs, who's the head of CISA, um, Chairman Pai at the FCC, um, Diane Ronaldo at NTIA, Dr. Copen at NIST, um, um, all, all of the, all of the, I mean, it, and, and Manish is right. It is, it is also NSF. It is also all of these other uh, agencies that um, that are that are key to this. We have to think about how are we going to secure this uh, this connected ecosystem in the future. And by the way, nobody's in charge of it. So, is it going to be a tragedy of the commons that um, that the, the whole ecosystem just gets trashed because nobody's in in charge of it? Or are we going to figure out a way to uh, to structure these incentives such that everybody's benefit, everybody's uh, equities are are maximized? Um, and that's that's what that's quite a challenge. So um, the the good news is there are a lot of interests behind doing just that. A lot of national interests, a lot of public safety interests, a lot of financial interests. So my uh, my glass half full take is we're going to figure this out somehow. It's probably going to be pretty bumpy in the in the next couple few years, though. And I would assert that um, if no one is in charge and it's a public good we're talking about, mm -hmm. then that is the type of thing that the government should fund mm -hmm. and that NSF right. is funding and um, the sort of work that um, ITS is working on. Um, and um, one way, I think, to 
um, secure it, not in the cybersecurity uh, level, but at the RF level. If I could take us to the RF level for, for, <laughs> a, for a few minutes. Sure. Um, um, because earlier there was talk about interference, um, mm -hmm. and Julie laid out some interference um, issues, and he pointed out, I believe it was over in the tutorial, that the first link is almost always wireless. Mm -hmm. And so in order to secure the RF level, we have to understand it a little bit better. We have to make it more approachable. We have to make, every, make, make it be something that... Um, is not just you know mystery and magic and black box sort of stuff. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that are happening in the government right now to be able to solve those sorts of problems. And um, I'm going to give some plugs here to ITS and the work that, that, that we do also, um, and that the work that um, NTIA does is so, um, so it, re historically regulatory, there's been like three different areas of interference um, that we've, that people have talked about. And Dale always talks about it, it's some, the earlier folks did too, well, one of them is, Intentional interference. That's our, our jammers and folks like that. And then we had the um, the um, the unintentional interference. And I learned a few other things about unintentional interference in the hospital examples that I wasn't aware of. But unintentional interference can also be things like um, um, devices that are malfunctioning or components within devices that are malfunctioning or something that is there's a small change in the manufacturing um, uh, uh, aspects that that cause a change in how the device is um, is made or um, there's erroneous programming, or there's intermod issues that nobody expects. So there's different things like that, or the spurs that folks were talking about earlier. Those are all sorts of issues um, that uh, will proliferate, the unintentional interference issues, uh, will proliferate as we get more and more devices out there because that interaction between the different devices. And, of course, Julie and the other folks mentioned on the first panel the incidental interference issues uh, also. Um, one of the other um, sort of late um, issues that Dale mentioned in the um, in the tutorial was uh, was big data as as a, as sort of an interference um, issue, um, and we maybe even talk about that a little bit too. But um, the other one, there's a two other ones that I'm seeing kind of popping up in the work that we're doing, and one of them is is aggregate interference, um, and that is something that um, we're working on at, at ITS. And aggregate interference is basically um, if you it's the um, when everything is, is, is operating at the same time. Everything is operating legally, um, but all that sort of stuff combined in the same space at the same time is, um, is potentially causing interference, and that's an issue um, that if the more we learn about and, and are able to analyze, it'll provide um, uh, you know, as, as assistance in the interference issues. Um, and um, the, um, the, qu the quality of, of what comes out of, uh, of the, if, if, if interference, Interference at the RF level can impact the quality of your experience and the quality of the information you're getting out of your med medical devices or the other sorts of things. And so all that depends upon the bandwidth of your latency and um, bit air rate and all those sorts of things. So some of the work that I think is ongoing to be able to, to deal with some of those issues um, is, I mean, there's a lot of work going on in a lot of places, in, in both in academics um, and throughout the government um, and at NSF and that sort of stuff. But I'll, I'd like to, if I could, mention a few. Um, one of them is the um, uh, one issue that has been in existence my entire career um, is uh, receiver standards. Um, and for the first time, the uh, Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee has, um, which recently was uh, reconstituted and um, had its first meeting earlier this uh, last well, last week. Um, one of the topics that they're going to be talking about is um, uh, transceiver identification. And given my sort of historical background um, in the Enforcement Bureau, from my personal perspective, this is not NTIA perspective, but my personal perspective is um, uh, transceiver identification will just be a game changer when it comes to identifying sources of interference. Um, one of the other sort of things that's maybe um, less um, obvious for, for non-spectrum geeks is um, the role that propagation plays in, 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 um, in interference. And one of the things that um, ITS is trying to do is trying to, to improve and um, uh, enhance the existing propagation models by um, adding clutter data to them and adding LIDAR information to them um, and looking at terrain and putting all these components together and making them modular so that there is sort of plug and play. And one of the things that we can do um, potentially also to make um, spectrum under, understanding spectrum interference more accessible to other people 
um, is, is once we get the, the models out and make them accessible through web um, services and through apps where people can plug in their locations and be able to um, potentially identify where the signal might, you know, how far the signal will go. What will it will it transmit through through a wall, or will it transmit through this forest, or will it only go a mile, or will it go ten miles, or will it, you know? So um, ma having some ability to be able to put this information out in the hands of the public, to be able to have a citizenry that is more skilled and more knowledgeable, or at least has the capabilities to be able to gain those that that information through um, enhanced understanding and demystifying, as I said earlier, the the RF work. Um, I think is one is one area that we can we can um, continue to work and going to your point about collaboration and sharing of information and working together. Um, another area where ITS does a lot of work is in interference protection criteria, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that um, I think is absolutely critical in order to reduce interference and increase efficiency, so that we can have more devices on top of each other in the same place in the same time, same frequency is if we understand the interference protection criteria between the different types of devices and systems that we're operating and working with. And the only way that we can really get that information is if everybody is sharing information about mm -hmm. the technical components of their systems. And it's really, really hard to get that done because there's proprietary, there's competitive, and there's security reasons why people don't want to share that information. Um, the um, NTIA OSM is doing a really good job right now with their feasibility studies to be able to try and get some information about some of the new systems on the DOD side, but we need the private sector to also be willing to be able to provide information and put it out there in some sort of a fashion where people can understand what the real interference protection criteria are so we can get those devices closer together and allow these systems um, to be able to, to, to continue to operate. Um, and the same sort of thing with the, with the aggregate. If more we understand about aggregate, the more we're going to be able to, um, to deal with interference when we have 5G and IoT devices all in a really close location. So um, I was going to leave it for there, but there's one other thing that popped up in the discussions earlier. You're on a roll. Then. I nope. <laughs> and then I'll, then I'll be no, quiet. No, so, um, but um, <laughs> folks were talking um, a little bit about um, privacy in some of the earlier panels. And one of the issues that um, has been lagging in us talking about, and I almost hate to bring it up because we haven't solved it also, um, but I think it's important, um, when, and, it, and it deals with the RF level, is the issues, and we brought it up in the International Symposium on Advanced Radio Technologies in, in 2016 when we did Spectrum Forensics, but that's the issue of what do you do with the information that's on your IQ data that you gather um, when you're when you're doing spectrum monitoring. IQ. Okay. Um, <laughs> I may have to ask one of the engineers to help me here. Um, in phase quadrature. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just another issue that I think fits into the whole issue, and it goes to the security issues also um, that we need to be able to crack in order to ensure that folks understand where their privacy is potentially vulnerable. Yeah. And that's all I have for right now. So I, I just uh, thank you so much for that. That was great, uh, that great was day. excellent, and I really uh, I'm glad you brought up the topic of uh, receiver standards because uh, that really can be a game changer. Historically, we've always talked about interference as something that comes from the transmitter side. That we regulate how much you're transmitting, what your transmit mask is, and we think that that's going to solve interference. Interference happens at the receiver. So if you're building a really sloppy receiver, and today there are no uh, uh, regulations about how much of uh, you know out of band rejection you have to build in a receiver so you can build a really sloppy receiver for the same transmit signal and get a lot more interference from adjacent channels whereas somebody else who's built a better receiver cannot right and we don't regulate that today so interference has to be thought about as something we regulate both at the transmitter and at the receiver level very very important Going back a little bit different topic, uh, you know, going back to the topic about spectrum sharing, right? So today, one of the biggest topics in spectrum sharing or spectrum coexistence in the commercial world is basically license systems like LTE and cellular moving into the unlicensed bands where you've had Wi-Fi for a long time over, right? And that's one of my personal research areas that I've been working on. And that is another one of these problems that uh, you talk to the Wi-Fi people, they say LTE is going to kill us. You talk to the LTE folks, they say we are much better than Wi-Fi. We'll coexist perfectly with them. We actually make them perform better when we are in their space. Truth is somewhere in the middle. And there is very little 
unbiased testing or experimentation or analysis that's attacking a problem like this. And uh, going back to standards for a minute, I was at an uh, IEEE coexistence workshop that IEEE ran, and they brought 3GPP folks into the room. And it's interesting to see the dynamics. They all agree that if they could have, for example, a common preamble that both would listen to and respect, both performance would increase. But they could not agree on what this preamble should be. So sometimes there is just this <laughs> hurdle that people have to overcome, these different groups, these different standardization activities. And um, I guess part of it is human nature. And I don't think we're going to change human nature as quickly as we can change technologies. But, I, but I'm hopeful that as people see that you know, if you're sharing a piece of property and if you play nice, everybody benefits, I hope that over time that lesson will sink in and systems will learn to collaborate better. And I think a great example of that was what we saw. If some of you have uh, seen some of the um, uh, recordings of the DARPA Spectrum collaboration where they gave points to teams based not on how a single team performed, but how the collaborative of teams performed, they found that you know, they automatically kind of picked policies that would uh, increase the sum rate of all the systems rather than just increase your sum rate. And somehow we have to move towards designing wireless systems that um, adopt this as the guiding philosophy rather than I'm going to increase my throughput at the expense of everybody else. Uh, aggregate interference is a huge issue and again is one of those things that we run into all the time uh, in terms of how do you model it, how do you measure it, uh, what are the effects. Uh, I think the ultra wideband whole effort sort of fizzled away because nobody could really figure out how you would model millions of ultra wideband devices that are each transmitting according to what they're allowed to transmit, but we don't know what the aggregate interference is at the receiver. So um, all of these sound very negative, but I, I really don't think so. I think just the fact that there are initiatives underway at various levels in different uh, agencies shows that people are addressing these. Um, data is, I think, the hidden um, could be a solution, could be more of a problem, but we cannot ignore it. Um, we have to be able to uh, exploit the amount of data that's out there. Wireless systems are great because we don't have to go and tap into wires to figure out what's going on, what the signal strengths are. We can really, really do a much better job of monitoring the spectrum around us. And one last thing, if I may, going Sorry. back to the uh, awareness and education piece. Uh, at NSF, actually, we think that's a huge problem. The, the workforce development of yeah. people just being aware of how important spectrum is. So one of the proposals that NSF funded, it was one of the power platforms. Part of that proposal was that they had to have a program called research experience for teachers. And this is high school teachers, and not necessarily high school science teachers. And they brought them in for the summer, and they made a modules with simple dongles with software-defined radios on them that allowed them to see spectrum. Most of them were seeing it for the first time in their lives to actually see just a waveform what it meant that a, that a particular piece of spectrum was occupied, what interference was, uh, how you could find spectrum holes. And just seeing the excitement of these uh, teachers and that we're going to take back that course material to the high schools and educate the next generation of kids as to this problem, I think is huge. We need to pay much more attention as a community on getting those kind of initiatives underway. Great, Any, do you wanna add more to that or? No, I think that's the, um, I mean, just to pick up where Manisha left off, that uh, the human element of this is uh, in some ways the most important and maybe the, the most difficult uh, because um, we're, <coughs> It, it, although maybe maybe I'm just a 45 year old guy and my three kids who are digital natives uh, <laughs> would, would totally disagree with me on this, but um, it, it, it maybe so. Let me let me flip from the from the pessimistic to the optimistic. Uh, hopefully, that generation that grows up, uh, um, you know, do, doing everything from school to uh, to some aspects of their you know 
of their playful life uh, on, on devices intuitively will understand how all of these things fit together in a way that is, would, is, would be foreign to us. Um, so hopefully that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's where this will go. In the meantime, I think we've got uh, the, the, the multidisciplinary aspect of these challenges um, is, is the hardest thing that we're going to have to uh, address because it will take uh, sp awareness of, of, of spectrum, basic spectrum issues, uh, awareness of basic software development uh, and you know, software development life cycle uh, issues, basic uh, systems of systems understanding. Um, and we're not there yet. We've got, we got a long way to go. And, uh, and it, it's going to be with all these acronyms that are, uh, that are out there. Uh, we, to, just, to, just to throw one out that's maybe my favorite is the worst acronym in, in DC, other than uh, Rebecca mentioned uh, CSMAC. Oh. <laughs> Pretty I bad did, one. I, I did, I did yeah, use the whole You spelled it out. I was really impressed with that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm an even worse one. I'm going to spell it out. Uh, Pierre is the CISRIC, the the, uh, the communication sector reliability, uh, security reliability interoperability council, the FCC's advisory <coughs> committee on essentially communication security issues. Um, the, it's, it's a pri mostly private sector, but also some, uh, you know, some uh, public sector, both DHS, 911 operators, other other experts who come together and try to solve these communication security uh, challenges. Um, and the last CISRIC, uh, uh, the last iteration of it, published about a 150-page report on 5G security, and went through every, went through the basics. And it was the most. It's a very comprehensive uh, look at network function virtualization, software-defined networking, the edge, and how you treat IoT. Um, didn't get as much into uh, into the uh, the core spectrum issues as uh, as maybe they, they could, but. Um, the, net, the present CISRIC has two working groups working on two elements of, of, of 5G security. One is, uh, is legacy vulnerabilities that may or may not transfer from 3G and 4G into 5G. And then two is uh, the, the present 3G PP standards process. And are essentially, to put it in layman's terms, are those standards good enough? Um, and, and if not, what, what optional uh, approaches need to be taken? Um, those are that's just the FCC, and it uh, and it has a it, it it you know it can be kind of cloistered in the communications sector, and and even even sometimes DHS might not know what's going on on the CISRIC, even though that's a, a great cloister of expertise, and we need to find ways for all of those activities to to feed into each other, and then to somehow reach out into the beyond the expert policy community into the just day-to-day -day business and consumer world. Um, so it's a big task. So I guess I'll just close by saying I'm counting on my eight-month-old, six-year-old, and nine-year-old to, <laughs> to get us there. Uh, one, uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, we should not forget the passive users of Spectrum, too, because actually at NSF manages the radio astronomy um, um, activities. and. That may not have any direct commercial benefit right now, but it, get, it gives us an understanding of science. So being able to understand, um, you know, being able to take measurements on certain parts of the radio spectrum is extremely valuable in uh, deep space exploration uh, and all of the other activities that NASA and all these telescopes are used for. And, and as the, the, these folks explained to me is that, you know, when we need to observe the emissions from an oxygen line, that we cannot move elsewhere. So we cannot share that spectrum with somebody else who wants to use it. If we need to observe the spectrum at that particular frequency, that's when we want to observe it. Today, because of this, large swathes of spectrum are blocked off because of this observational capacity. Those guys are willing to share in the sense that we're not observing all the time. When we observe, we don't want anybody using it. But when we're not observing, you're free to observe it. Today, we don't have any systems in place that allow them to do that, that allow the commercial world to do that. And so the default category is that nobody uses that spectrum. So there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways of maximizing efficient use of spectrum in a way that benefits everybody, the, the, the passive users as well as the active users of spectrum. 
And that will require trust. That will require trust, yes. And that goes back to the whole idea of community and humans and uh, how much do we believe everybody is watching out for each other, right? Because right now there isn't. There is always that tension of, I need to hold on to this because if I agree to share it, it's going to be taken away from me. And we need to change that dynamic. Ah, OK. Perfect timing. So we're being asked to move to audience Q&A. So per the, the ground rules of silicon flat irons, uh, first question needs to come from a student. So do we have a student volunteer? We have a hand up over there. Hold it, Pete. I'll let you just hold on a second. I'm, we're not getting audio. I just want to make sure that people on the live stream can hear you as well. Hello? That's me. Ah, okay. There we go. Hi, I'm Alan. I'm a 3L here at the law school. Um, my question was, so I, I came into this conference, Spectrum Security. I thought it would be much more focused on avoiding things like hacking, exploitation of the systems, jamming, etc. But so much of the focus of uh, the panels has been on just developing systems, whether it be 5G or 3.5, rolling out systems that actually work. Um, in the aggregate when the systems are densified without betraying themselves. Um, so my question is, how much are we prioritizing sort of in securing the RF layer in just getting these systems to work versus how much are we focusing our energies on avoiding the more malicious, exploitative types of um, vulnerabilities? And does one solve the other? If we design a system that works to um, you know, not betray itself in the first place in this harmonious and it works, does that as a byproduct prevent a lot of the exploitation or hacking in the first place? Great question. That's a very good question. Do you um, have a volunteer to tackle uh, that? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do a confession again here, I guess. Um, so um, so in, the, in the 3.5, um, the, uh, the con conformance testing was done on the components of the system, I think, as I had mentioned, not the systems of systems. And so the question becomes is, as you said, once it's out and, and working, will it work? And can we assume that all these things will work together? But I think the first panel pointed out that there, at, at all of those interfaces, there's always vulnerabilities. Um, and even in the testing that uh, we had, uh, that, that ITS did um, on the spectrum access systems, we did do security testing on it. Um, but we, but, and I was recently asked this past week if we had done any sort of red team type um, testing on the SAS. And no, we didn't because of the environment that we were in. We were constrained to the types of security testing that, um, that were designed through the standards organizations in the way that we did it. So um, I think it's a fair question, and I think it's something that we all, that, that anybody that, that's, that's we, we, all, we all need to think about that one more, too. Yeah, I, I think the systems, all of the systems, uh, and I guess in uh, CBRS, it's mostly, again, either LTE or 5G that's going to be deployed. Well, it's a technology neutral, so we don't know. Yeah, that. right. <laughs> so whatever system gets, de de uh, gets designed does get designed using certain attack models in mind, right? And so you design the systems to make sure that they're robust against these. But with security, you always are faced with what happens after you deploy them. And there, are attack mod and there are attack models that you hadn't planned for that bring down your system. What then, right? That's the really tough part. So to go back to your question, yes, most of these systems are designed. I think the second part of your question is, how do you deal with attacks that you hadn't thought about bringing down your system? And that really is on a case-by-case -case basis. There isn't a very well thought of way as to how we solve the problem. So some of it is maybe you have to go back to the standard and fix a hole in the standard that nobody thought about. And so how do you make that uh, this thing? The other thing is you can patch up stuff, right? So for example, the IMSI, uh, uh, it's kind of, it's not really nobody, I don't think anybody really thought of that that would end up being a security problem, but it did. And there isn't a solution to it even today, right? There are some ways of trying to identify, but there isn't. And that is a problem. And I, it's not a solved problem, unfortunately. 
And I, I would also echo that that's a, that's a great question. Um, and the way I would answer it is that, um, in my view, my perspective has always been in thinking about what the bad guys can do. Um, in some ways, building a system that works and, and works transparently to itself, uh, so, such that it, 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 it notices if there's an anomaly, uh, is a predicate to addressing the, uh, the malicious threat. And I'll, I'll, I'll give two examples uh, in, this, in, the, in the wireless world uh, where we're, we're seeing some progress to that, uh, to that end. One is uh, something called the, uh, the Open RAN Alliance. Uh, this, this is essentially radio access networks that are open, whose standards are open and, inter and interoperable. Um, the idea being that you can get to security by interoperability because you, it, interoperability requires standardization. And if, if somebody, and we've gone through this whole uh, day almost, I think, without mentioning the word Huawei. Uh, so <laughs> I, guess, I, I guess I'm that guy. Uh, if, 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 there's an, if, if there's a player in the RAN world that's trying to do things uh, differently or even in a customized, bespoke way that's not interoperable with other systems or not interoperable with other, uh, uh, with other core networks, um, then there, that might be a, that could be a security problem, or it could be a, a way to get into that network that uh, that would not be as easy to get into if everything is standardized. The second one, and this is at the other end of the network, is um, is something I don't know if there are any folks from from uh, the Cisco world here, but Cisco has been has pushed a uh, a standard called the MUD standard, and I'll give you the the uh, spell that out. It's the Manufacturer's Usage Description. Uh, and this is for an end device, so, so a widget, a connected widget that is on a network and it's talking to a router or some other gateway uh, um, uh, function. And it, under the manufacturer's usage description, the, when, the, when, the, when that widget first connects to the network, it tells the network, here's what I do. Um, and so if the network senses that that device is doing something other than what it's supposed to do, it, it basically can kill the device on the network, um, and so it's it. This is a this is a um, it, it's a mix of of transparency to the network or to the system, uh, and anomaly detection uh, that can only happen if you have the predicate of a system operating the way it's supposed to, transparent to itself. And one other thing, if I can just uh, some of the earlier panelists were talking about um, the data that they've got about um, security events or interference events um, and the hospital um, issues. Um, when, and they all have them and, and their information is kind of you know, in their own little bucket. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been an advocate for sharing those types of events and incidents and making that information um, more accessible to everybody, to, especially to academics, to be able to research it because I think that that is potentially a ripe area for AI also to be able to maybe get ahead of these issues um, on securities and vulnerabilities if we can do some sort of post-processing analysis of events that um, have been reported and have been identified, but just we haven't shared the data across, um, across industry. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of work happening on anomaly detection or receiver identification. So for example, can you identify, so we focus a lot about the actual messages that are going over the air. But there's a lot of information also in the IQ samples and the actual signal itself. And those are almost like signatures of the device that's transmitting. And you can use that. People are showing as, them, as more and more data comes online that it's becoming, it's becoming possible uh, to identify a receiver just by observing its transmission over time, by collecting the data. And you can figure out what the nonlinearities are, what the unique uh, characteristics are. Just like all of us have you know, unique characteristics that we learn over time, you can do that with receivers. And this is where machine learning and data is, is beginning to show dividends. Great. We had another question down here. Hello. Um, is this on? Yep. Uh, I'm Parker. I'm a second year student here at CU Law. Um, and it seems like one of the common threads throughout multiple panels has been that we need to increase the diversity of voices uh, at the outset of standard setting. 
um, but that it's incredibly difficult at the international level. Is there something that the FCC or another agency in the U.S. at a national level um, can do to help amplify the voices of those independent security researchers or um, academia, like we discussed? Um, yeah, so um, in the U.S., we've always uh, taken the stance that standardization is in the domain of industry. They know best how to do it, and they've done it very well. And so there isn't any government level, federal effort to, to manage that in any way or form. Uh, it is actually the burden of, for academics participating in standardization bodies is pretty high. These meetings are held like every two months all over the world and you've got to travel there for a week and there's a preparatory, it's a full-time thing, which is very hard for academics to do, given that their full-time job is teaching and research in a university setting. Uh, there are successful instances, however, of academics uh, collaborating with industry, so where the industry partner is actually going to the standards, getting a lot of the relevant information, and having the academics put in their um, in innovativeness and solving problems, coming up with solutions. Um, to, to that they can then take back to the standards body. So maybe not the most efficient way of doing it, but that is how it, it's done today. And um, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's, it's, that's just the way it is being done, and I will leave it up to the FCC and other agencies if they want to address uh, whether there is any bigger effort uh, in, 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 in involving the uh, federal government at a level um, uh, in standardization. Okay, well, we've, we've run out of time at this point, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Good discussion. All right, so we're just going to um, move uh, straight into the, the second pillar of this event, um, something I've been looking forward to not just today but for quite a while. Um, if we could get the panelists to uh, clear the stage, let me just say a few words uh, about our closing keynote, sir, uh, Dr. Lisa Porter. She's the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, uh, DOD. Uh, she's a scientist that was trained at MIT and Stanford. Her job is to um, oversee R&D and prototyping activities across the whole DOD enterprise. And that includes overseeing this whole alphabet soup of all sorts of different agencies. DARPA is one that most people in the room would probably know. Um, her brief is very wide. Um, it includes artificial intelligence and biotech, and that's just the first two letters of the alphabet. Uh, and you can go and read about more of them. Uh, the reason why she's here today and why we're so privileged to have her is that uh, the DOD has named her as the leader of its um, 5G strategy and initiatives. Um, I've heard it said that, uh, and they say this a lot apparently in the DOD, uh, she didn't duck fast enough uh, in that discussion. <laughs> So as a result, she's learned a lot, I'm sure, about spectrum and spectrum management and discovered how complex and interesting uh, it is, whether she wanted to or not. We're very, very fortunate to have uh, a scientist and a public servant of her caliber here. Um, I asked around to, you know, to, you know, if there's anything about her that I should mention in addition to the resume that you should read. Um, and I was told that she doesn't like long introductions. So I'm just going to shut up now. <laughs> Dr. Lisa Porter. Yeah. And, uh, can you get the, um... So this, where's my presentation on here? This, uh, I don't want to have what happened to Julian happen. Yeah, to right. Yeah. That's just... Because uh... I don't have my sock puppets handy. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm gonna let you do it so it doesn't get messed up. This was his, I think. Yeah. This mic. Uh, let's see. Yep, that looks right. All right. Let's go ahead and put that in there. All right. Does that work? <clears throat> Eventually, maybe. Oh, there we go. All right. 
Okay, let's see. All right, I'll stand here. Can you guys hear me in the back? All right, excellent, thank you. All right, it's really odd to be giving you a talk this late in the day, so I apologize if you guys are really itching to get out. I'll try to cover this um, fairly quickly, but I also will allow time for questions, so for those of you who want to stay and ask questions, we will have time for that. All right, so I thought I would start off, and, and yes, I, it, it is a true uh, anecdote that I did not duck fast enough. Um, I am an engineer and, and physicist by training. How many of you guys consider yourself scientists or engineers? Okay, so you can relate to this. So I was in a meeting in uh, like early February of this year, minding my own business, um, and 5G was the topic. And, this, and of course, it was a very important meeting. The Secretary of Defense was concerned about what is this 5G, what should we be paying attention to. Um, we need to understand it in terms of our mission and what we need to be executing. And then there was just a bunch of baloney being swirled around. And so for those of you who are not engineers, I apologize, but when you're an engineer in a room and you hear a bunch of non-engineers saying stuff that they're like throwing out every acronym they know, but they don't really know what they're saying, depending on your tolerance level, which for most of us is right around 45 minutes, you then, then your head just kind of explodes, right? So that's what happened to me. My head exploded. <laughs> And so then the bad, the bad thing about that is, of course, when you finally raise your hand and you say, you guys are full of it, this doesn't make any sense, it's not even, I don't even know what you're saying, they look at you and go, great, you, you got it now. <laughs> uh, so, and I never learn, right? It's like, this just keeps happening to me. So, um, yeah, so that's how I ended up with it. Um, and yes, I, I'm not an expert in spectrum. I will confess to you that I have been really blessed that the DOD actually has deep bench in this area. Um, of course, the FCC and NTIA has deep bench in this area. And I've been very fortunate to get to be a little bit educated on it through all of those great smart people and also come to really appreciate this whole domain and the folks who work in this in this space. Um, it's really awesome because it's a really techno nerdy area, right? It's really cool. And I and one of the things that came up in this panel um, about workforce development, I think actually we have to make that coolness more apparent to our to our young folks who are going through universities because it's a really awesome area to be to become expert in um, so I've enjoyed getting to learn about this despite having first been handed to it a little bit you know with a oh, oh no it's mine um, I'm glad now that that I was asked to do this so I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of how the DOD has come to get our head around this topic and try to figure out what we should be doing that's appropriate to our mission um, and I've tried, for my colleagues and myself, we've really tried to engage with as many in industry as we possibly can. We recognize how uh, smart industry is in this, in this domain, how long they've been thinking about this, and their perspectives have been very valuable in helping us to shape how we're, how we're going to go forward. So the first slide here shows some key themes. I think some of you have heard these themes today. Um, interestingly, this graphic comes from Cisco, a paper they published in 2014, and I intentionally use that because I think it's actually not a bad graphic to demonstrate what we mean by where we're going toward in terms of ubiquitous connectivity, but clearly people in this, in this um, area have been thinking about this for quite a while. Um, it is really important, I think, for the broader community to understand, those who are coming into what is 5G and what does it mean to me, to really recognize that 5G is not just 4G on steroids. Um, it is not just about the RAN, and it is not just about cell phones, and it's not just about, you know, cat videos at a faster sp speed of download. So um, we've been really trying to message this hard, because when you think about what ubiquitous connectivity means, and in the context of the prior panels, um, it does present both a lot of opportunities as well as a lot of challenges in terms of the vulnerabilities. Um, so we really have to be mindful of that. Uh, when we we, we recognize there's no such thing as a secure system. Uh, this has been true since before 5G. This has been true forever. Um, and I think we fall into a trap when we think we can design perfection. 
so this was alluded to in a couple of other panels, and I was very glad to hear other people expressing that that perspective. We obviously strive to make things more secure. We strive to dr address vulnerabilities, but we should keep in, in mind uh, an approach that we like to call a zero trust. And in the cyber domain, and some of you are real cyber experts, you know that the zero trust architecture approach is one that's gaining a lot of, of speed because people are recognizing as things become more interconnected, perimeter defense approaches really do not make any sense. They actually never really did, but they really don't now. So we are really pushing and advocating for zero trust architectures as part of the thought process. And then the third point, which is really important, when you talk about vulnerabilities, and people brought up Huawei, or at least one person brought up Huawei in the prior panel, um, the DOD has, has a perspective that, that's very simple. We have a mission. We have to be able to operate through anywhere and anytime. We don't get to choose where we deploy or when we deploy. We have to be able to operate. And so we are approaching 5G and next generation ICT more generally in terms of how do we ensure that we can operate through, regardless of who's there trying to prevent us from operating. Um, and the military that, main, that masters ubiquitous connectivity, in our opinion, is going to be the one that maintains overmatch. So ubiquitous connectivity was alluded to in the prior panel. I liked how it was characterized. It offers a lot of opportunities, many of which we cannot fully anticipate today. And it also offers a lot of vulnerabilities, many of which we cannot participate, uh, anticipate today. But we have to adopt the mindset of continually being flexible and adaptable in our understanding and our ability to both defend and exploit the 5G opportunity space so that we are, in fact, the masters of our domain. All right, so <clears throat> this next slide talks a little bit about Operate Through in the context of its relevance to the broader first responder community. Uh, so for those of you who have an interest in the first responder problem space, you recognize that there's, there's a good amount of overlap between what I just said and what first responders have to deal with. Um, the ability to operate in congested and con uh, in degraded spectrum environments and the ability to operate over networks that may be compromised. So we see in a lot of talk, a lot of conversation earlier today, we really see an opportunity in moving from the static and manual approach to spectrum allocation to one where we really strive for dynamic spectrum sharing approaches. Um, and that's a big part of our strategy as we go forward. Um, the the um, CBRS example, the three and a half gigahertz example that was talked about, I think is a really great proof that this is a possibility, that we need to get serious about this and that we can get serious about it. It is something that's going to require true collaboration, as was talked about prior panel, around both industry, DOD, and other government agencies saying, how do we do this together? Uh, but it is doable, and we've got to work, start working on it now. This will give us a significant national advantage, um, competitive advantage globally, if we solve this problem. Because if we figure out how to do this, of course, we will be able to maximally use a spectrum, and, and others may not be as good at it if they don't figure out how to solve it. So we are really excited about what dynamic spectrum sharing can potentially offer, although we recognize that it is very difficult, particularly when you look at a lot of, a lot of frequencies and things moving around, a lot of different devices, and so on and so forth. Um, I would add to that again, we expect to look at robust no, uh, overlays in our networks as well as the zero trust architectural approach that, that I mentioned prior. And the Cisco example um, that, was, that was given, the MUD example, is one that I think is motivated in, in part by a zero trust mindset, right? It's don't assume that something can connect to your network based on who they say they are. There's a constant need to be doing endpoint security and endpoint verification and validation. So those kinds of, those kinds of thoughts are already out there in industry, but we want to amplify them and coalesce them around a strategy. So. Here comes our plan, our overview of our DOD plan in one slide. Um, it's always good to have one slide in the, in the government bureaucracy, right? Because typically that's about the attention span of most people you brief. And then second, you, <laughs> you always have to have a graphic, some pretty picture. And then the third thing is every strategy has three points, right? Always three points. So A for effort here. So um, we have a graphic. And it is DOD parlance, so you'll see warfighter to warfighter, warfighter to machine, machine to machine. If you are in the commercial or private sector, substitute human for warfighter. 
and you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of overlap uh, between the the amount the sorry the um, use cases we're interested in and those that will have commercial or private sector relevance. So we've circled four, and it may be a little hard to see those, uh, but one of those areas is is the VR AR application space. As you know, this is an area that's greatly uh, interesting to the commercial sector for a lot of gaming applications, but for the military, there's a lot of opportunity here. We see in training and. Um, that that's kind of obvious, as well as potentially um, medical types of things, but also educational, which for both DOD and the private sector has interesting um, applications. In the center, you see smart DOD ports, um, camps, bases, and stations, obvious analogs to smart cities. And in fact, the NSF uh, representative on the panel earlier was talking about PAWR or power, um, and part of what we intend to do with DOD is partner with NSF and do some lessons learned as they've been building up those test beds as we push forward to try to develop test beds that explore how we would really do this at scale. Um, there's also the logistics management supply chain, obvious commercial and DOD analogs, and depot um, automation, think warehouses, think depots, again, pretty clear commercial analogs. So when we talk to industry and we ask them, are these the kinds of use cases that are of interest to where you're looking to push 5G? They said, of course, you know, this is not a secret. We've been talking about these things. And we said, well, would it be interesting to you if we had some collaborative experimentation that allowed the DOD to accelerate what you're already doing um, into our space, but at the same time would allow you, industry, to perhaps expand the experimentation base that you're currently conducting and really look at some different interesting use cases? And they said, yeah, that would actually be interesting to us. And so with confidence, we go forward and we say, okay, industry, we're interested in working with you in collaborative experimentation. This has obvious DOD benefit, but we believe it also has a benefit to industry as well. The operate through part of our, of our strategy I've already commented on, we definitely need to make sure that we can operate anywhere and any time. So part of what we'll be doing as we do these tests at scale on our DOD test uh, facilities at various bases is we will be doing red teaming. That was a question that came up earlier. Uh, red teaming will be a part of what we do to explore the vulnerabilities as we explore these different use cases so that we can understand how we can improve the uh, ability to operate with these use cases while reducing our vulnerability profile. And then finally, the innovate part refers to the fact, this is something that I'm personally passionate about, that there is no finish line here. So there's been a lot of parlance in the popular press around a race for 5G and who's winning the race. Um, and I'm not a fan of that analogy because a race implies a finish line and there is no finish line. Uh, 5G is just one stop along the way to continued progress, hopefully progress forward as we go. So it'll be 6G, 7G, and fill, fill in the XG. Uh, and we need to continue to push ourselves as a country to be at the leading edge of innovation. So this is why partnerships with uh, NSF, for example, are very important to us because we want to bring industry and academia along and push things forward in the cutting edge. 5G right now promises a lot of things, some of which will come true, some of which we will fall short. The, the areas where we fall short and we learn through experimentation where we're not ready, we want to continue to innovate and figure out how we address those things. So that's where you're going to see a three-pronged approach from us where we'll have some investments that are more longer term, higher risk, technology readiness level being lower because we see that we've got to keep pushing. So for those of you who are interested in working with us, um, we will be putting out a, solic a solicitation in fairly short time frame, hopefully. Um, you'll see at the bottom, the, the bottom um, of this chart indicates an initial draft RFP is anticipated uh, in early November. But uh, I mentioned the use cases already. The, the initial RFP will, will say, okay, these are the initial US cases we'd like to try. Um, these are the initial DOD bases that we're thinking of trying them at. This is the kind of information we, th we think we can provide. This is how we think this is going to go. And then the nice thing about having a draft RFP is it allows industry to come back to us and say, you forgot to address this, 
or this part is confusing, or we're not sure how this IP coordination is going to work, how we're going to protect our IP and still to address what you're trying to do. And that conversation can occur when you have the draft RFP. And then we put out a final RFP that's hopefully tailored enough that industry says, hey, that's a good request you're asking for. We understand what you're asking, and we can respond to it. Um, now, we expect to do this in a rolling fashion, meaning there's no way we can know everything, nor should we know everything right now to ask for. And so rather than trying to put out every single use case and every single base all at once, we're going to do this in a rolling fashion. Um, we're still working out the details of how many bases and how many use cases will come out in the first uh, solicitation, and then how many will come out, let's say, three months after that, and then another three months after that. Um, and these are estimates. Every number I give you is an estimate, roughly three months, right? I always have to be careful because people write this up in the press and, you know, the roughly disappears. And so, um, so when I, when, you know, in the government, no, nothing is ever precise, right? So just keep in mind that we, we try to give you as much information as we can, but there's always a, a squiggle next to what we say. Um, so if you're interested in how to work with us in these large scale test beds and, and how to work um, collaboratively, even if you're in the pri in academia, he says there a role for us. Absolutely, um, there are many members of the National Spectra Consortium whom, with whom we are working. Some of you may be members already. Um, they have both academic and industry members. It's really easy to become a member if you aren't one already. Uh, they really make the barrier to entry extremely low to join. And you can participate if you're a member, but you can also participate as a sub to a member if you're not a member, okay? So you don't have to be part of the National Spectral Consortium to ultimately participate in this activity, but you will have to be a sub to somebody who is um, a member. And I would, I would note that we're pretty heartened by the response we've gotten over the past few months from our NSC consortium members who have provided over 260 technical concepts for us, you know, in these kinds of use case areas. Here's what we think. Here's what would make sense. Here's the commercial use case and the DOD use case we see working out. We're calling all that together and figuring out exactly what we ask for in that initial draft RFP. So what I'm trying to message to you here is it's an iterative process to try to get it right so that when we go forward and say these are the test beds we want to set up and we're looking to industry and, and the private sector to work with us to do that, it makes sense and it doesn't sound completely crazy and people more or less say, hey, I know how to respond to this and bring something reasonable to the government to go do. So. Um, what are we going to get out of these test beds? Uh, well, we're hoping that we'll get some fieldable prototypes. And we intend for them to remain at the DOD locations. And hopefully they'll be delivered within about three years of the start. Okay, That doesn't mean we couldn't deliver some things earlier, but ultimately we're expecting a three-year kind of effort. Uh, we're hoping they'll be turnkey solutions so that if they work, we can actually scale them to other sites fairly easily. So in other words, we don't have a lot of additional NRE to invest. And we're hoping that, you know, there's a... Um, there's an opportunity to learn because we know not everything's going to work as advertised. We know we're going to learn some things. A lot of the discussion during the day has come up, all those things we're going to learn. Some of them are going to be some pretty ugly lessons. Um, but that's okay. That's how we advance. And we just, we can't be afraid of that. We've got to try things in new ways. And the things that don't work, we've got to make sure we write down our lessons learned and share those and provide those so we get smarter as a community. That's a key commitment that we have here. So our deliverables will include things like the infrastructure sufficient to support the prototype products and services, but also the lessons learned and the software and firmware development kits, excuse me, that will allow us to, to do continued development and fielding. So um, that's kind of the big picture of where we're going. At MWCLA in a couple weeks, I'll be rolling out a little bit more detail. I have a little more, uh, the teams are rapidly working as fast as they can. I should mention that all the services are engaged. This is, this is really a DOD writ large effort. We are closely collaborating also with our agency partners. We have good participation um, from the NSF folks thinking about the, the innovate part of our strategy to other parts of the national security community and how do we test for vulnerabilities. And of course, as I mentioned, with, with industry as well as with FCC and NTIA who, are, who have been very supportive of what we're trying to do here. Um, the dynamic spectrum sharing will be also part of what we try to explore. Uh, the 37 gigahertz, I think, uh, was mentioned this morning by Julian uh, about uh, it was one of the areas that we're collaborating on. I think that provides a good opportunity to say how might we do dynamic spectrum sharing in the millimeter wave 
uh, regime, which I think, by the way, the United States has a real opportunity to get way out in front if we figure that out. So <clears throat> 5G timelines. So the, ups, the, the, part, the top part of this chart is something you're all familiar with. This is kind of the standard timeline that you guys have seen. You see the 3GPP rel rollouts. Um, you see the FCC auctions on there nicely. And then it looks like we were planning for this all along, doesn't it? Yeah. It didn't suddenly happen in February. No, we had this all along in play. So it looks beautiful. Um, yeah, so this is the other key when you're briefing, and the DOD always have to have one of these charts, and everything has to look like it was planned all along, just like this. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but in all seriousness, we actually uh, are pretty pleased with how things have come together. And again, we couldn't have done this, frankly, without the support of FCC and NTIA, who have been there working and, first of all, educating me, but also being supportive and saying, hey, we want to work with DOD to figure out how we work with industry to solve some of these really hard problems, particularly with the dynamic spectrum sharing. Um, but this is a hard problem, by the way. It's not going to be something we, we solve tomorrow, but we have to be committed to do it, and we're just really thrilled with the partnership. So there was a lot of conversation about partnerships earlier. Um, I thought it was a little too negative, not negative, but a little too, like, gloomy. I think the partnerships are actually working very well. The United States is not a centralized communist country, thank God, and we shouldn't be. And we shouldn't get overly worried about how Chinese and other communist countries run their stuff, because we don't want to become China to beat China. We have a lot of our own specialness that allows us to be truly competitive on a global scale. Uh, so we don't want over-centralization and, you know, really heavy-handed, top-down, government dictatorial processes. And I think that's why the FCC has been so good historically is they recognize that and they try very hard not to be too heavy-handed as they at the same time put in the regulatory frameworks that allow us all to be successful. Um, the DOD is trying to come at that from a, hey, we want to be collaborative with industry. We're not trying to be heavy-handed. We are going to identify vulnerabilities that we hope that you will want to work with us to solve because we want to be able to use your stuff and therefore everybody's successful. But I'm not overly worried about, frankly, how China does their thing, because we're not China and we're not going to be China. Um, we're going to do it our way, and our way is the better way. That's, that's just how I think. So, All right, so one final slide. I did read your, um, your summary paper that was a summary of your workshop in March. I think it came out in June, but I will admit that I only read it like a week ago in prep for this. Um, it was really great, and Julian did a great job summarizing it. Um, but I put this slide together in part to address, I thought, some of the things that, was, that were raised in there and some of the perspectives I would point out in response. Um, so many of the lessons we have learned with our current networks, I think, will translate to 5G. Uh, things that have come up, like stronger encryption, and as well as the improved privacy protection. Um, the MC issue came up, uh, you know, things like that. I think we're smarter now than we were when, you know, 10 years ago, and that's good. And we should actually look at that and say, all right, let's leverage what we've learned and let's take those lessons forward. Now, we also should be recognizing, and this has come up and I was glad to hear this, um, 5G is, is really going to lead to a true convergence of all these different modes, uh, the mobile, fixed, wireless, and wireline, which have historically lived in their little stove-piped worlds, including their standards bodies right, and that came up a little bit earlier. Uh, we have to move past that. This is going to be a truly converged system, and so our security solutions cannot be stovepiped by mode. That's going to lead to a lot of suboptimal solutions. Um, so that's a hard barrier, as it was, it was discussed earlier, human nature being what it is. Everyone carves out their little turf wars, or sorry, I should just say their little turfs. Um, but we have to recognize as a country that if we figure out how to collaboratively think about this as one big problem versus stovepipe problems, we're actually going to do, I think, a really good job. Now, there are numerous attack vectors, and you guys talked about some of these all day today. Um, from, a, from a true attack, as opposed to things don't work right, the question that came up in the prior panel, things like massive IoT um, DDoS, DDoS attacks, excuse me, against the RAN. This is one that you'll hear talked about a lot. It's kind of obvious. Um, it's not obvious how you solve it, though. So you have a lot of problems with endpoint security challenges as well. That came up earlier. Um, so there are things like that that we know we have to address. These are not the unknown unknowns. These are the known 
knowns, whatever. This is, this is stuff we actually know we have to deal with. Um, NFV SDN, just because I didn't feel like spelling it out, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's network function virtualization and software defined networking, exploitation. Um, is often raised as a concern. A lot of it is because NFV in particular is still new and we have to figure that out and how that's going to work um, and what we're going to do to ensure that we're, we don't introduce too many vulnerabilities into that. And then of course, this is something I always want to emphasize, attacks against the edge from third party apps. So we, ha we can't forget that software and third party applications are still a huge source of vulnerability. People are really fixated on components and hardware and software is still going to be a huge problem. In fact, there was an article that just came out, and uh, I get these, you know, daily updates on all the all the articles. Uh, and it was in federal something. It was one of these small co federal computer networking online. It was like one of these small trade publications, and it was it was about how the NSA identified that software is is really the biggest issue we still face in cyber. Um, and so we can't forget that. We can't forget about the applications community. How are we bring them in? to our standards bodies discussions. Where are they in 3GPP? Uh, that's kind of an open question that we need to think about. Um, and then the other thing I like to point is that, that 5G also presents some interesting opportunities from a security perspective. So some of these came up as well, and I'm, I'm kind of bullish on this. Um, software defined networking to me also <coughs> provides huge opportunities because if you do that right, and you have containerized approaches along with AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning in particular techniques, you should be able to do real-time monitoring and response. And most of the folks in industry are bullish about this too. Now, it's not easy, and there's a lot of work that has to be done here, but it's credible to assume that that's a doable do. And so there's an opportunity space here around really leveraging what SDN has to offer particularly when you combine it with machine learning techniques. So we shouldn't just look at the bad side, the scary side. We should look at what F5G really might offer as opportunities. So with that, I will just close. Um, the military that masters ubiquitous connectivity will maintain overmatch. That's one of our key takeaways. Uh, 5G is not a race, as I said. We, we really want to make sure that we're emphasizing 5G to next G, uh, continually pushing ourselves all the way. And then, of course, 5G... Technologies are both enablers of and sources of vulnerability for our economic security, our homeland security, and our national security. So DOD strategy is trying to leverage the strength of U.S. innovation, and that, that's what we're hoping to accomplish. So with that, I'll take questions. much, Dr. Porter, for just a terrific uh, key, keynote, speak, uh, keynote speech. What, when I hear this, though, I get concerned. We, have a, we had a student here, a very smart student, who put together a paper on the monoculture issue that we're putting everything in the 5G basket. And if 5G gets sick, it spreads through all these different applications, all these different vertical markets. And uh, the Irish potato famine, I think, is a very clear, a very clear example of what monocultures can produce. And recently, Pierre found one in bananas. Apparently, there's one particular strain of bananas that everybody is using now, and now that particular is, is subject to some sort of a root virus or something, and now is causing major problems. So that's the big headline issue that I have been around for quite a few years, am uncomfortable about. And there's people like Keith over here, a lot smarter than I am. He, he can probably express that more in the, uh, in the right terminology, but I have to confess, it does bother me deeply. <clears throat> so I think, uh, if, if I'm understanding your point, because I don't, I, I don't think it's really about bananas. Um, I'm kidding you. Um, you. Ubiquitous connectivity is a daunting proposition, because when everything is connected to everything else, then there is a huge problem, right? But using a common 5G, but using a common 5G. It's the 5G, everybody using 5G for everything from heart monitors to controlling valves up yep. here in the dam above. It's the 5G. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. 
Uh huh. It's the five. You real, total reliance on five G that disturbs me. Okay. If it gets sick. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, I. We have to. We have to face that reality. Frankly, we're going to have to figure out how to address this realm that we're all marching toward. I'm, I'm not sure how else to answer that question, or if it's a, if it's even a question. So uh, if I may just address that concern a little bit. So I know that we are focusing on 5G here, but in actuality, there are actually a lot of modalities that we are using to connect these devices, yes, right? Yes, yes. Wi-Fi 6, we didn't talk about Wi-Fi much. That's the huge other parallel connectivity mode that we're all using. Uh, there is these low power, long range methods that that are out there, which are not 5G, which are alternative methods. Some of them are proprietary, some of them are standardized. Most of the low power um, uh, health monitors are using Bluetooth low energy, or they're using some other connective modalities. Um, so yes, 5G, they, they want to do it all. I don't know whether they will actually do it all. They do want to take over the world, but I think all of these parallel um, methods of connectivity will survive. And if a virus were to strike 5G, hopefully one of these other smaller systems can come in and sort of come up with a new way of connecting these devices together. But, but I think it also goes to, and that's why I was struggling to answer your question, if you, if you don't think about ahead of time the architect, from an architecture perspective, how you deal with that, with the reality of, of the more complex a system is, the more interconnected it is, um, you, you're going to open yourself up to a world of hurt. So things like zero trust architectures, which are really about how do I how do I think about segmentation, uh, network overlays, endpoint um, authentication techniques. How do I get smarter about assuming, frankly, that bad stuff's going to happen? And it's more about resilience. Assume bad stuff's going to happen. Assume a part of my network may go down but the whole network isn't going to go down because I have alternative means of connecting. Um, I think that's the mindset we have to bring to this. Um, I don't know if that helps uh, answer your question, but I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to pull out, make sure I'm addressing the right, the right point. Funny thing about the Irish potato famine, there's a a biotech potato that's resistant to late blight, which is the virus that caused the famine, it's been banned in Ireland <laughs> because they don't like GMOs. I really um, don't know what to do with that, but okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we can easily get caught up in analogies, but there, there sort of are, there's a reason why monoculture is the way farming is always done because it's, you know, it's most productive with all these benefits. And there's only one problem you have to solve. And as long as, you know, as long as, this, as our engineering talent is focused around the 5G and related standards, then all those eyeballs can be put to work to make the system more resilient. Mm -hmm. And there's not like a universal virus that can spread through the whole 5G ecosystem and destroy everything. Mm -hmm. That's not the way networks work. Right, right. But there is an advantage to focusing our talents onto a, a, a problem that can become sort of generally well understood, right? Yes, yes, agreed, agreed. Hi, my name is um, <clears throat> Chris McGillan. I'm a uh, 2L here at the law school. And um, one of the things I'm interested in is um, as you push forward, new technologies like this, necessarily at the tactical level, the training objectives will focus to becoming very competent at that new technology and how to employ it. But then it, by addressing that concern, you're, you also talked about how at the deployed location, you won't actually have the network able to um, utilize the technology that you just trained to. So how does the DOD address the fact that the majority of your training objectives over the course of this life cycle that you're talking about are going to be 
compromised potentially at the deployed location. And so you're essentially putting time and effort and theoretically from the computer level, it'll be fine, but at the person on the ground level actually doing the throttle work, that's gonna be a very different thing. And so I just wanna generally sure. address that. So, and, and remember, we have these problems today, right? It's not, it's not like it's a new thing to say we go places and people are trying to keep us from operating. And we have network challenges we have today that the DOD has to be able to establish comms in areas where people are trying to keep us from communicating. That's just fundamentally true and will always be true. So the way we address that is we train as we fight. Um, and that's why our training bases are so important. Um, and that's why things like CBRS are actually such a big deal because it was kind of alluded to, but the details around that are the Navy needs that spectrum when it needs it to operate its radars. And that's why that was, a, and I think, I think it was NTIA who brought up, you know, it was, it kept her up at night to make sure that there wasn't any unintended consequences of sharing that spectrum because we train as we fight. And so we do think always about how we're going to operate in integrated spectrum arenas. So that's why for us dynamic spectrum sharing is so interesting because on the DOD side we want to take that experimentation, look at it how we would do it in times of peacetime, if you will, domestically, but also how we would take those tools and techniques and use them in times of adversarial conflict, right, which it will no, no longer be sharing because they're not giving it, you know, they're not willingly sharing it, but, you know, we will have to work through that in order to ensure we can communicate in those environments. Does that make sense? Um, it, it does, yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Joe Carey with Trimble. Um, as I understood your slides, you're looking at 5G predominantly for uh, logistical and and that sort of thing, not in the combat arena. If if I understood correctly, uh, can can you verify that or correct so, me? So 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 I think in terms of how we're collaboratively experimenting with industry, our first focus is on how do we accelerate our ability to adopt those capabilities for the kinds of examples you cited: logistics, smart ports, smart bases, all those kinds of things that have obvious commercial analogs that people are talking about now. When we talk about operate through and how we might really want to understand dynamic spectrum sharing and take it further to dynamic spectrum, let's call it utilization, um, then that is absolutely about how we would operate in more congested and contested environments. Yeah, but that won't be relying on the 3GPP 5G standard necessarily. No, yeah. Okay. Right, but, <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the dynamic spectrum sharing, right? Well, obviously, we want to drive though. We want to be, and I think this is where the United States has an opportunity globally to be a leader. And of course, Julian, cor correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think you know, in terms of how we approach that, if we can drive that, then there will be standards that we that we drive, as long as everyone's collaboratively sharing. Um, but the DoD is going to figure out additional techniques and tools. Let's put it that way. And so, a related question. I'm sorry. Um, if I may, sure. is uh, so. So my understand is my understanding is that most 5G systems operate at shorter distances or shorter ranges than most 4G systems. Although there may be some exceptions, and I would think that in your concept of operations, that poses a problem. So I would say that 5G offers an ability to also introduce millimeter wave, which does, of course, operate over shorter distances. Um, and that's, I think, a feature. I think people are mischaracterizing millimeter wave actually out there. They're, they're characterizing that as a bad thing. But actually for many use cases, both commercially and militarily, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if I have a factory and I want to have, you know, an automated factory that I'm, I think it would be really great if I don't have to worry about it interfering outside of my factory, right? Um, you can imagine how millimeter wave is extremely interesting to the DOD because we don't, you know, that gives an advantage. So I think it's actually a good thing, and it's complementary. And again, Julian, you can comment on that as well. Yeah, it really is. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worth. I think it's worth it. No, no, no. We want to get it on the live stream. Could we just go to Michael? I better say something. Well, you got to start sometime. Oh, thank you. No, uh, so. 
a lot of folks, because there's been so much focus on millimeter wave, <laughs> uh, which is a key component, uh, think that's it. It's short range, not going to go very far. But it's actually, you know, we've had this strategy of providing spectrum at low band, mid band, high band. And the carriers have are either deploying or have plans to deploy in each of them. So you're going to see... And what you are seeing is heterogeneous networks yes. that combine each of these. So if I want to get out farther, I'm probably going to use the low band for that. I may not have pound for pound as much bandwidth as I have higher up. but uh, And that's why there's also so much focus on the sweet spot, the mid-band spectrum, whether you're talking two, three, or so forth. Uh, so it's not just short range. <laughs> right. Because if you were trying to cover the United States all with millimeter wave, it really wouldn't be practical. <laughs> so sorry if I was jumping in, but, it, but it's really important that. to understand I, that. I think it it's is. not one band. Yeah. It's not, it, it's going to be deployed and satellite as well. Right. And you're going to see flavors of it. Uh, it may not be because 3GPP is even working on standards for device to device and so forth. So you're going to see lots of variations of this in different frequency bands and, and, and so forth. I think that's an important message. That's why I wanted him to comment because there has been a mischaracterization of what 5G is about. And it really is about all those bands and using the bands appropriate to the use case that you're, you're driving toward. I can take one more. So, um, Jim Dillon, I'm the um, internal audit, um, IT audit director for the, for the university here. And um, I just wanted to check a little bit on our understanding of, of zero trust. I mean, I, I certainly applaud the concept that, yeah, things are, things are, 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 um, are not trustworthy mm -hmm. in, in many cases. Um, my understanding of zero trust is, includes a lot of data monitoring, AI-assisted anomaly detection, mm -hmm. um, behavioral norms, stopping things that are out of norm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, zero trust is one thing in a closed system, say like a corporate net network, and quite another in a ubiquitous and open system. How does DOD pursue zero trust in the face of totalitarian concerns or the loss of personal freedoms that may be promoted in a zero trust environment where every action is monitored and possibly recorded? Will that impact the ubiquity forecasts? Um, I hope Write that down ahead of time. I had to because okay. I, I could have taken two two hours to try and okay. inform the question. So, correctly. but I think you're asking so. So I think you're asking a really good question, and, and zero trust is obviously easier to implement for a network over which you have so, sort of some sense of control. Now, you understand that, of course, zero trust is a response to historical approaches to do perimeter-based defense, essentially, um, and we're trying to drive people away from that. And a lot of it is also, it's not, it, you know, you can't just assume something is, quote, trustworthy to be added to your network because it, the person says they're trustworthy. Right. Or because, oh, well, you know, I, I've used this before, so it must be okay. So a data-driven approach is really fundamental, to, and you, you touched on that. And um, that doesn't mean we've figured out how to solve for an, a completely open, diverse system. I mean, you know, to your point about imagine different devices and some we haven't even anticipated and they're not all going to have the same capability, blah, blah, blah. But, but from a mindset perspective, that's what we're trying to advocate for. And it does drive you to a different set of solutions and ways of thinking about it than if you say, I'm going to draw perimeter defense kinds of approaches, right? That's what we're advocating for. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and for staying as long as you did. You. Okay. Oh. Sorry. Thanks. So that was a spectacular end to a fantastic day, starting with Julie, going through three panels. Uh, thank you all for being here in the, f in the face of the storm. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, notes to close. The, um, the presentations are going to be posted on the website. There will be video. There will be transcripts. Uh, two students, uh, Chris McGillan and Greg uh, Callahan, are actually going to be writing a report, so keep your eye out for that. We're going to um, move to the reception now. So if you're a student and if there are still students, Please make sure you talk to a practitioner. If you're a practitioner, please talk to a student. Um, you will be getting email asking you for feedback. Please tell us what we can do better uh, and what you liked. The next Flatirons conference is in two weeks here. It is about entrepreneurship uh, in rural America, 1 p.m. Thursday, the 24th. Hope to see you here then. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs>